Beginning with the machinery of freedom, he's published many books and articles in top journals on subjects of both law and economics, which I believe gives him unique expertise in these topics. And uh, I had the privilege of driving up with him from the airport. And based on our conversations, I think we're in for a treat this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Friedman. A very long time ago, uh, there was an exchange between a couple of prominent Chicago economists, Gary Becker and George Stigler, and a couple of prominent Chicago legal scholars, uh, R Richard Posner and Bill Landis. And Becker and Stigler had proposed the idea of converting criminal law into something more like tort law, of treating crimes as things that would be privately rather than publicly prosecuted. And uh, Landis and Posner pointed out they were in effect reinventing tort law and made various arguments. And I got interested in it for fairly obvious reasons. And I ended up writing two articles. And one of them is a theoretical article, which I'm not going to discuss today, but it's on my web page showing that a particular argument that Landis and Posner had offered for why it couldn't work was wrong. Uh, there was a way around it. But the other one was a historical article because it occurred to me I knew of a real world society in which if you killed somebody, his relatives sued you. And that was Iceland uh, during the period of the sagas, roughly from 930 AD to 1262 AD. And so I tried to figure out how that legal system worked uh, and wrote an article. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. And I learned a lot of interesting things doing that. Uh, and some years later, I got interested in a different legal system, which was the criminal law in 18th century England, which on paper had exactly our legal system. We were there were who we got it from, except they had no police or public prosecutors. And so the question was, how is criminal law actually enforced? And the answer was that any Englishman could prosecute any crime. And in practice, it was the victim or the victim's agents who prosecuted crimes. And I tried to figure out how that system worked, and in particular, why anybody bothered to prosecute a crime, because unlike tort law, you didn't collect damages. All right? you, they just hanged him, or transported him, or something. Uh, that, all of that was quite a while ago. And about six years ago, it occurred to me that I had been lazy for too long, that both of these pieces of research had been fun. I had learned a lot of interesting stuff from both of them, and I had done nothing of the sort for quite a while. And the problem which all of us face is how do you commit yourself to doing something you think you should do? And my solution was to invent a course called Legal Systems Very Different from Ours, announce I was going to teach it, and then go to our librarians, uh, we have quite good librarians at SCU, and ask them to find me every book they could describing some exotic legal system. And they presented me with one of these rolling bookcases, two, sh two or three shelves high full of books, and I went through finding the interesting ones. And so I created a seminar I've now taught three or four times on legal systems very different from ours. And the underlying theory of the seminar is that all human societies face about the same problems, that they solve them in an interesting variety of different ways, that it's not clear that we're any smarter than people in other times or places. They were grown-ups too. And that we ought to take all of those solutions seriously. We should think of each of them as one way in which a set of human beings structured their legal system and try to understand it and make sense of it. Uh, and I found it to be quite a lot of fun. Uh, sometimes you get ideas we might want to borrow. Sometimes you just learn more about how law works. Uh, it, I, it's a, it's a semester-long seminar, so I can't do all of it uh, in the next hour or so. Uh, if you're sufficiently curious, I'm turning it into a book. The draft of the book is up on my webpage for comments. You're welcome to read, read the, the draft and send me comments if you like. Uh, the book as currently organized consists of two divisions, one of them being chapters describing legal systems and one chapters describing what I think of as threads, issues that run through many different legal systems and how they're dealt with. Uh, and I thought that for this talk and this audience, I would try to focus especially on features of legal systems that ought to be of interest to libertarians, although I won't limit myself to that. And I want to start by talking about a kind of legal system that is observed in many times and places, and that I currently believe 
almost all existing legal systems were built on top of. That is, I have explicit evidence for about four major legal systems that they have what I think of as the fossilized remnants of this system, and it's feud. Feud as a legal system is a very simple system. The idea is that if you wrong me, I threaten to harm you unless you compensate me. So it's a decentralized private legal system. It's existed lots of times and places. I would argue that unofficially it exists today. I'll come back to that later. Uh, the essential requirement for feud to work as a legal system, I should say, by the way, feud and feudal have no connection. It's a very natural mistake. The two words, feud and feudal, sound similar. They are etymologically unrelated. They come from different origins, and they describe different systems. So what I'm talking about is not a feudal system, interesting though that is, but a feud system. <clears throat> the essential requirement for a feud system to work is that my threat to harm you is more believable if you have wronged me than if you haven't. All right, if that's not the case, then it's just straight extortion. Uh, so in order to have a workable feud system, there must be some mechanism such that when you have really wronged me, it is practical for me to threaten you and you will probably back down and compensate. Whereas if you haven't really wronged me, it isn't. And I can run through very briefly uh, three different unrelated legal systems which solve this problem in three different ways. And I will start with the simplest. Uh, about a thousand years ago, the gypsies left northern India. And they spread over a good deal of the world and separated into a bunch of different communities, which have many things in common, but also things different. And one of the gypsy groups is the group called the Roman Chal, who are the main gypsy group in England at present. This is modern, a modern legal system existing, as it were, in the cracks underneath the official legal system. And the, gyp the Roman Chal gypsy have a what, simple feud system, what I like to refer to as a primitive version of the system of the 10th century Icelanders. And the way it works is that if you have wronged me, I threaten to beat you up. And you and I both, if you don't compensate me, and you and I both know that if you really have wronged me according to the norms of our community, my friends will back me and your friends won't back you. That's the way in which right makes might in that very simple system. And therefore, generally, if you really have wronged me, either you compensate me or you leave town. Uh, there is an interesting book called Gypsy Law, which has chapters by different people. That's my source for this information. And the authors of the chapter that discuss the Roman Chal also discuss the question of why they have that system and some other gypsy groups don't. Because the largest gypsy group is, are what are called the Vlachram, and they are the gypsies who were ensurfed in Romania for about 400 years. And they have many things in common, but many things different from the Roman Chal. And in particular, the basic way the Vlachram system works is that if we have a dispute we can't settle, a meeting is called at which all adult male, at least, members of the community are welcome to come. In some Vlachram communities, women as well, some not. And they argue out the case until this community meeting reaches a consensus. And then the consensus is imposed on the parties by threat of ostracism, by the threat that if they don't go along with it, they will be considered marime, polluted, and other members of the community won't have anything to do with them. Uh, so it's a far very different system, and yet this is coming ultimately from the same, the same culture. And the explanation, that the conjecture that was offered by the authors of the chapter is that the original system was the feud system, but that the feud system needs a safety valve. It needs the option of leaving town in order to avoid violence if you can't sell it otherwise. And in fact, in the Icelandic system, when you were outlawed, you had two weeks to leave Iceland, after which it was legitimate to kill you. Uh, and it was tortious to defend you. I'll get to that in a minute. So their view was that when the Vlachram were ensurfed in Romania, they were tied down. They couldn't move because each group of Vlachram were, the, in effect, the property of one of the Romanian lords. Since they couldn't move, the feud system got too expensive, too much violence, so they switched to this different system. I'm not sure if they're right, but it was quite neat having a, almost like an experiment 
of here are two parts of the same culture who get separated and put in different environments and evolve different institutions. I should say there are other, the gypsies are really quite interesting. There is a different group I'm not going to talk about today um, in Finland, uh, the Kali, who apparently are the one known human society that not only has no institution of marriage, but for public purposes denies the facts of human reproduction and yet survives. But that's another interesting story. Let me go on from the Vlachram to my favorite feud system, which is Saga period Iceland. And that was a system where the mechanism for right makes might was an explicit court system. That Iceland was not an anarchist society. It was a society that had some but not all of the features of a market anarchy. There was a legislature and a court system, but no executive arm of government. So if I thought you had wronged me, I sued you. I went through legal processes and there was a court case. The court delivered a verdict. The verdict was you owe me 50 ounces of silver compensation. You either pay or you don't pay. If you don't pay, I go back to the court and the court declares you an outlaw. You have two weeks to leave Iceland. If you don't, it is legal for anybody to kill you and it is tortious for anybody to defend you. That system functioned for about a third of a millennium. So considerably longer than ours has. The last 50 years it was breaking down. But even during that period, my guess is that the level of death from violence was probably lower than the breakdown of our system, which happened in less than 100 years in 1861. Uh, in any case, uh, interesting system. My third example, which I know less well, but more than, than I did a year ago, is northern Somali. The traditional legal system in Somalia, uh, in northern Somalia at least, was a feud system. It was a feud system without a formal legislature in court in which there were, however, traditional mechanisms when a dispute arose for creating a court to try it uh, and there were traditional, <coughs> essentially legal traditions, uh, customary law rather than an explicit legislated law. The particularly interesting and weird thing about the Somali system is that it relied on a system of coalitions that was built partly on kinship and partly on explicit contract. So that you have a group of people, some of whom are related through the male line, so-called agnatic kinship, and some of whom aren't, who have all agreed that if one of them is wronged, they will help him recover a damage payment uh, if the person who wronged him won't that if one of them is found liable for a damage payment, they will share part of the cost of it. Uh, and, of course, if he collects a damage payment, they also get a share of it. And there are explicit written contracts setting up these groups of people. One of the sort of neat things I discovered reading about it is that they have a term for a coalition of this sort that is not built at all on kinship. All right, a coalition which is purely to get enough people together to defend themselves. It's called a pile of shields. And that was the term they used for the US coalition against the Soviet Union. That looking at us from their standpoint, instead of them from our standpoint, how did they fit us into their pattern? Uh, the comment one Somali is quoted as making is that in Somalia, your genealogy is like your address in Europe that every Somali has memorized his genealogy for about 20 generations up. And it matters because the closer somebody is in this system of agnatic kinship, the more likely it is he will be an ally in a conflict. And you will have a situation where you've got a group of a particular size, which might conflict with another group who all have a common great-grandfather. Then some of them get into a fight with a bigger group, and these two, in effect, fuse and become allies in dealing with that. So it's really quite an interesting system, but again, it's basically a feud system. It's basically a system where law is enforced de in a decentralized way by the threat uh, uh, of violence. Uh, the final feud system I'd like to describe is alive and well in America today. That in my view, one way of making sense of current high-tech patent litigation is that it is a feud system which has a problem. And the sense in which is a feud system is suppose you're Apple and you're thinking about suing Samsung on the claim they violate your patents. And suppose you think you're probably going to lose. 
Suppose your case isn't very strong. It looks as though it still pays to sue them because to begin with, even if you're in the wrong, you might win. It's, there, there are mistakes in the court system. It's not a perfect system. And even if you lose, while the case is going on, people will be less willing to buy Samsung phones because they're afraid if you win, they'll have to withdraw some of their phones. That means you can sell more iPhones. So there's an incentive to attack people through the legal system whether or not they're guilty. But there's a good reason why Apple might not want to do that, especially if they think they're going to lose, and that's because Samsung can attack them in retaliation. All right, Samsung and can and in fact did sue Apple on similar grounds. So in that system, part of what limits the violence in a legal sense, that is the litigation rather than actually killing people, is the threat of retaliation. The hole in this system, however, are the firms referred to as patent trolls, which buy patents in order to sue other people for violating them, but don't use the patents themselves. Because if you're not using a patent yourself, nobody can sue you for violating their patents. So you therefore have a real problem, which a lot of people sort of in the current legal academy are concerned with, of innovative companies having to, in effect, pay off people who threaten to sue them, where there is some argument that they have violated a patent, but maybe not a very strong argument, but it's expensive to defend, and if you do lose, you lose your company, or you could lose your company. Uh, so this raises an interesting question of how you might modify our legal system to prevent this. And the solution I am currently proposing is borrowed from another unrelated legal system, namely Periclean Athens. Uh, I'll say more about it a little bit later, but one feature of the legal system of Periclean Athens is that for at least some tort suits, the losing tort plaintiff owed damages to the prevailing defendant. Uh, I believe it was one obel in the drachma, which I think was one-eighth of the amount that the plaintiff claimed. And one, there's a lot of discussion in the modern literature about whether or not a losing party should have to pay the other party's legal expenses. But my argument is even if there were no legal expenses, as long as courts make a mistake, it always pays to sue because you might win. But when you sue someone who is innocent, you're imposing a cost on him we ought to penalize you for doing that. How do we do it? We say, if you sue and lose, you owe him some damages. And if you did that, then the patent troll business becomes much less attractive. And part of what interests me is that I hear I'm combining ideas from two radically different legal systems, both of which in some sense help make sense of our system. Let me now go on from these feud systems, which are pretty violent systems. Uh, when I was researching Somali law, my original source was a book written by a libertarian, uh, a Dutch lawyer who lived the last 12 years of his life in Somalia, and then edited by another libertarian. And I don't trust books written by people who agree with me because I'm too likely to believe them when I shouldn't. So I did further research and discovered that there was a retired London School of Economics anthropologist who had been studying the northern Somali since the 1950s and was clearly the leading expert on the subject. So I got everything I could of his. I then emailed him my chapter on Somalia, or maybe a bunch of questions about the system. He emailed back that he wouldn't answer my questions, but the book of his that had the answers to the question was such and such. I found that book online and it had the answers to my questions. So that was sort of fun. But he has a throwaway line somewhere to the effect that in the Horn of Africa, every adult male has an AK-47. Uh, so it's not a very peaceful society, although it was a functional society. Uh, what happened in Somalia, by the way, is that you had a stateless society. Uh, the northern half was under British theoretical rule and the southern half Italian. The British mostly left things alone with a little bit of intervention. Then when the, when the powers pulled out, they jointly put the two together as the country of Somalia with a central go democratic central government, which Somalia had never had. Uh, it lasted for a little while, and then there was a military coup, and they had a military dictatorship. Uh, that then got overthrown when it got into a war with Ethiopia, and the Russians changed side in the middle, which was a bit of a problem, because they'd been the supporters of Somalia. Uh, and ever since then, the UN has been trying to reestablish a central government, and after a while, the Somali around Mogadishu 
figured out that if there's going to be a central government, it was better to be the ruler than the ruled, and they've been fighting over that ever since. The North, the Somali set up something called the Republic of Somaliland, based much more nearly on traditional institutions, but nobody will recognize them because that would be admitting that Somalia wasn't one country, but that's a long digression. But let me now go on from all these people who like killing each other to a society that is so pacifist that if you rob one of them, they won't call the police the Amish, because the Amish are also a society that should be of interest to us, because arguably the Amish are anarchists. They are very rule-oriented anarchists. They are anarchists in two senses. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the Amish, but they are a Christian religious group uh, descended from the Anabaptists who migrated here from Germany and Switzerland in the 18th and 19th centuries, I think. Uh, they're a very successful group. Uh, there are going to be more and more of them in your future because the Amish have modern medicine and traditional family sizes. And the result is that the population doubles about every 20 years. Uh, but the Amish have a set of rules uh, called the Ordnung. And they're quite restrictive rules in some ways. They are things like not owning cars. However, you are only bound by that rules after, as an adult, you have sworn to be bound by them. That essentially part of their heresy, so to speak, was that the Anabaptists rejected infant baptism on the grounds that an infant couldn't sign a contract. And so their position was, until you're an adult, your parents may have some authority over you, but the Amish rules don't apply to you because you haven't yet agreed to them. And once you, as an adult, choose to be baptized and swear to keep the rules, only then are you bound by them. So in that sense, it really is a voluntary government. Furthermore, it's a rather small government because the set of rules are specific to the congregation, not to the Amish as a whole. And a congregation has between 25 and 40 families. And the reason it's limited to that number of families is the Amish do not build churches or meeting houses. So the whole congregation has to be able to fit into a large farmhouse for when they have their services, which is what they do. They build their houses in ways designed to make that possible. So you have this sort of micro, micro state, as it were, of 100 people or so. Uh, it makes rules. In theory, changes of the rules require unanimous consent. It's hard to know how much social pressure there is, but in principle, the clergy have, there's a meeting every year at which the clergy say if they've decided on any change they want in their communities or noong, and <clears throat> anybody can veto it, and you presumably keep talking until agreement is reached, and they can't have the next step of the religious uh, process until they reach agreement. Uh, furthermore, their enforcement, the ultimate sanction, the equivalent of capital punishment, is ostracism. So that what basically happens if a member of the congregation violates the rules, one of the clergy who, by the way, are chosen at random by a, well, their nomination is not at random, but the choice is, is random by God, so to speak, and it's a lifetime position, unpaid. Uh, there are a few clergy for each, each congregation. One of the clergy goes to you and says, look, you violated the rule, please stop doing it. If you keep doing it long enough, eventually you get what is called maidung, which means that other Amish are very much limited in how much they can have to do with you. So it's, an, it's not an absolute ostracism. Your wife can't sleep with you unless she also gets ostracized, but she can talk to you. You're expected to eat at a different table from the other members of your family. Uh, other people will deal with you sort of at only at arm's length. But that's, that's the ultimate sanction. And you can always leave, of course. Uh, so they're quite an interesting society, uh, and it's functioned for a long time. It seems to continue to function. Uh, they lose about 10 to 20 percent of their population at, at each generation from people leaving. They don't recruit, but with family sizes of six or seven kids per family uh, on net, uh, they're increasing uh, pretty rapidly. So that's an interesting case of a society which uh, depends entirely on voluntary interactions and, in fact, works quite well. Uh, they've had various collisions with the U.S. government. Uh, the big difference between the Amish and the Gypsies, in my view, is the Amish have much better PR. Uh, 
uh, that the Amish have this sort of image of noble 19th century American farmers, which doesn't describe them very well, but that's the image. So the result is that they have successfully won a Supreme Court case by unanimous decision, freeing them from compulsory schooling. That essentially the Amish, I believe, are required to school their kids up to eighth grade, and thereafter, coming home and helping to run the farm in the house counts as homeschooling, according to the Supreme Court. Furthermore, they have their own sort of one-room schoolhouses, uh, which are almost certainly in violation of state requirements for everybody else in most states, but they have successfully gotten permission to do it. So they've been quite successful. Uh, they don't have to pay Social Security taxes if they're employed by other Amish. If they're employed by non-Amish, they do. They don't collect Social Security. They convinced Congress that since it was against their religion to collect, it was unfair to pay because insurance is not trusting God properly That's, and because they're supposed to take care of their own people, basically. So they're really quite an interesting case of a subgroup, what I think of as an embedded legal system, a separate legal system inside an existing state, which has been pretty successful. Uh, let me now go on to what's, yes? Just a question, what happens if you get two Splits, splits, splits. Don't know, have to ask them. Uh, but, uh, and I should say, whether a, whether a congregation is territorial depends on the particular community. That there are places, because the Amish, I should say, tend to cluster in the sense you'll have a bunch of congregations which are what's called an affiliation, meaning that their view of the rules is similar enough so that their kids court across from one congregation to the other. They'll invite a, the bishop of the other congregation for a guest sermon and that kind of thing. In areas where <coughs> there's only one affiliation in, in a community, you are likely to have pretty clear geographical definitions. So if you want to change from one congregation to another, you'd have to move. In areas where there are several affiliations, they overlap so that you may well be able to, as a, to change your congregation without moving at all, just by saying, I'm leaving this one, they're willing to have me. So that's sort of interesting. But let me go on from this very decentralized system to one of the other interesting systems in the opposite direction, and that's Imperial China. Because uh, Saga period, Iceland landed for, lasted for a third of a millennium. Imperial China lasted for about 2,000 years. And we know quite a lot about their legal system. And it turns out to be interesting in a whole bunch of different ways. One way that's relevant to both libertarians and to modern lawyers is that we have evidence that there was essentially no contract law and yet very elaborate contractual practice. The island of Taiwan was ceded by China to Japan about 1900. And the Japanese decided that instead of trying to enforce Japanese law on the Chinese, they would simply enforce the existing Chinese law. And to do that, they had to find out what it was. So there was a scholarly project of a bunch of Japanese academics producing multi-volume stuff on what is the legal system in Taiwan at present. It survived. And I read an interesting chapter by a modern legal scholar discussing contracts. And it turns out that you had quite elaborate contractual practice uh, comparable to modern, including contracts across the straits to mainland China and such, almost nothing legally enforceable, and so what's interesting is looking at how you structure contracts in order to minimize the need to rely on a court enforcing them. And I actually have a published article called From Imperial China to Cyberspace because I'm arguing that for online dealings you have very much the same constraint, that it's hard when you're dealing in a world where national boundaries are invisible, which they are on cyberspace, to use national courts to enforce your agreements, and therefore you're facing the same problem of how do you structure a contract to minimize the need for legal enforcement. And if you're curious, that's up on my webpage like many other things. Uh, but that was one interesting thing. But there's another very interesting thing uh, about it, and I'm not sure if it's attractive or unattractive, but it's interesting. Uh, one of the things we associate with very oppressive governments is the idea of forcing children to inform on their parents. In imperial China, for a child to, inf to accuse a parent of a crime of which the parent was guilty, 
was a criminal offense by the child. It was illegal to report your parents for breaking the law. All right? Why? One answer always is because their culture said so, because they believed in filial obligation. That might be true, but it's not very interesting. What I want is a functional explanation. And my functional explanation is that they were ruling a population of a, by, the, by 1900, by the end of the period, of about 400 million people. And they were doing it with a tiny elite bureaucracy of scholar officials. As you may know, Imperial China invented the civil service exam. And only they had a very weird civil service exam. This is an exam open to almost everybody in China. But it's an exam essentially in literary accomplishments. In how much, in how well you can write poetry, how much you know about the great works of the past and so forth. The people who get high scores of this end up as high level government officials. Amazingly it worked. That is the system did function for a long period of time. It seems quite weird. Uh, it was sufficiently open so that if there was a really bright kid in your village, the other peasants get together to make sure he gets fed so he can spend all his time studying because if he gets even a moderately good score on the exam, which is probably you know, one person in a thousand or something, he can do a lot of favors for the rest of his village as a government official. Right. But one part of this system is you then have a fairly small number of very, I should say one other neat thing about the system is the people who got the sort of second highest grades end up as district magistrates, which means combination sort of mayor, chief of police, and judge for a maybe a million people or 100,000 people. The people who get the very highest grades go into the censorate, which means their job is to spy on the district magistrates to figure out whether they're corrupt or not. So they actually had a professional body trying to keep their own system honest. It's a very interesting system in lots of ways. But my theory of the reason why you couldn't inform on your parents is that if you're trying to rule a huge number of people with a very small number of, of officials, you do it by subcontracting the job. You find other authority structures in your society that can do most of the job of controlling your people's behavior. And in the case of Imperial China, the obvious candidate was the extended family. So that you had extended families with extensive rules of relationship with many people, not just a nuclear family like ours. And they wanted to maintain the authority of parents over children, grandchildren, nephews, etc. So that that could substitute for their having to enforce the rules themselves. Well, if I can, everybody's breaking some law, right? It's true now too, probably true then. If I, as a child, can threaten my parents, if you don't do what I say, I'll report you, that weakens the authority structure of the extended family. And they were willing to give up some ability to enforce their own law in order not to do that. Did other things as well. Everybody in, within a family is classified as a senior relative or junior relative. So your younger brother is a junior relative. Your uncle is a senior relative even if he's younger than you are. So it's by the descent tree, as it were, and then within that by age. Any offense committed against a senior relative, the punishment is ramped up. Any offense committed against a junior relative, the punishment is, is ramped down. So it looked like the whole system is in part structured to maintain this authority system within the extended family. There are a bunch of other things related to the same problem of how you control the system without needing very many government officials. Uh, part of it is you make it in people's interest to avoid the legal system. That the general view, I think, in that culture was you don't really want to get enjoy involved with the system whether you're innocent or guilty, plaintiff or defendant. Uh, you could torture people in that system, legally, including witnesses, not just defendants. Uh, now, one of the problems that might occur to you and might have occurred to them is that if getting involved in the legal system is a real pain, then one way of attacking an enemy is to accuse him of a crime. Ah, that'll get you involved in the legal system too. That's all right. You want to accuse him anonymously. In imperial Chinese law, it was a criminal offense for an official to read an, a unanimous, an anonymous accusation. And in the first round of the rule, there was an exception if the accusation was of treason. And then they removed the exception. <laughs> so anyway, you can see why a lot of this is fun, trying to understand how these systems worked. <laughs>
There is one other feature of the system that's also sort of interesting. And it's interesting partly because it's echoed by the Ottoman Empire, which is another long-standing, not as long-standing empire. And that's that in that system, the district magistrate has a lot of power. He's basically the ruler of a noticeable chunk. And there's then the danger from the standpoint of the emperor that the system will turn into feudalism. Not feudal, not feud, but feudalism in the sense that the district magistrate will in effect end up as an independent lord with his own power base. Feudal magi uh, district magistrates are moved around every three years. The district magistrate is not allowed to marry anybody from his district. So that they're dis the Ottoman system is sort of really quite clever. The Ottoman sister system is they, they, they conquer some area. The area has rulers. If you tell people if we conquer you, we're going to kill you, they're going to fight really hard. On the other hand, if you leave the rulers in place, well, if you're weak in a few years, they might revolt. So what the Ottomans do is when they conquer an area, they take its rulers, they move them to the other end of the emperor, empire, and they make them important Ottoman officials there. So on the one hand, there's an incentive to surrender. It's not going to be so bad. You're still going to be a top dog, but you're going to be a top dog in a place where your power depends on the, on the sultan, and therefore you have an incentive to be loyal to the sultan. So that was rather fun as well. Let me get back to Athenian law, because Athenian law is fun in a whole lot of ways. I like to describe Periclean Athens as the legal system of a mad economist. Uh, because it has the feeling of sort of very bright people with crazy ideas that might work or might not work kind of thing. Uh, and I should start out by saying that our main source for Athenian law is orations. Because the way the system worked is that if you were a defendant or a plaintiff, you didn't get to have a lawyer plead for you. That you had to make your own case. But you could hire an orator to write you an oration which you then memorized and recited. Some of these orations were good enough literature to have survived. So a lot of what we know about Athenian law basically consists of the case, of the argument made by one of the two parties in a case. Most of the time we don't know what the other side said. We don't know who won. So we don't know how much of what he said was true, but at least it was plausible enough so that he could hope to persuade this huge jury, about 300 people in an Athenian jury roughly, uh, that it was true. Uh, <coughs> a number of interesting things about that system. To begin with, you've all been told that ancient Athens was a democracy. Well, sort of. It was a democracy in the sense that all adult male citizens could vote about the law in the assembly. However, officials, just like the Amish, were chosen by chance. I'm not sure if they believed God was doing it, as the Amish clearly do. But the Athenian system, all officials except generals, that didn't work too well, but all officials except generals were chosen by lot from adult male citizens of the appropriate age for a one-year term. So it was a government of amateurs entirely. Uh, the, they have a jury trial with as a, several hundred people in the jury. And their division of kinds of cases, their equivalent of the criminal tort division in our system. I assume all of you know that you can never be the victim of a crime in America. It is legally impossible to be the victim of, for you to be the victim of a crime in America. And if you don't believe me, look at the name of the case. If somebody mugs me, the case will not be Friedman versus Smith. Sorry, if someone mugs me, the case will not be Friedman versus Smith. It will be the state of California versus Smith that legally speaking, the victim of every crime is the state. That's in fact the fundamental difference between tort law and criminal law in modern systems, is that criminal law treats offenses offenses against the state, tort law treats them as offenses against the victim. Part of the reason I was interested in this Becker-Stigler-Landis-Posner controversy about whether you could convert, convert uh, criminal law into tort law. Uh, one of the talks I give at law schools is should we abolish the criminal law, which is a fun title. You can hear a recording of that on my webpage if you like. Uh, but in any case, the Athenian division was between those cases that only the victim could prosecute, like our tort cases, and those cases that any, uh, again, adult male Athenian citizen could prosecute, which were like our criminal cases in that he wasn't claiming to be the victim. And then the question is, why does anybody bother to prosecute such a case? 
And the answer was that for most of their criminal cases, the successful prosecutor got a cut of the fine so that uh, there was an incentive. Now, it's obvious to us and was obvious to them that there's a problem with that. You now have an incentive to find somebody who is rich and unpopular and accuse him of something. Ah, but if the uh, jury of several hundred people, if fewer than 20% of the jurors vote for conviction, the prosecutor is fined. 1,000 dirham, uh, sorry, 1,000 drachma, which was roughly three years wages for an ordinary working man. Not so much if you're rich, but it's not so important, but still a serious penalty. So they had thought of the problem, the over-enforcement problem, essentially. This, when we talk about problems with punitive damages, that's what we're worrying about, that people will sue people who are innocent in order to get the money. And the Athenians said, all right, you lose, you pay. Uh, and how much you pay? Well, in the, in the, in the criminal case, it's the fixed amount. But the, as I mentioned earlier, in the tort case, it's proportional to how much you claimed. So if we had something like that, there would be an incentive not to overclaim in tort cases. Another useful idea. But let me go on to uh, my favorite example on, uh, of the mad economist approach. And that's the Athenian solution to the problem of producing public goods. And the Athenian solution was that if you were one of the richest Athenians, every other year you had to produce a public good. So the relevant magistrate comes to you and he says, you've heard that we're sending a team to the Olympics this year. Congratulations, you're the sponsor. Or see that lovely trireme down at the deck, a warship. Guess who's paying for her this year? And there are two ways of getting out of it. One way is to show that either this year or last year you've already done one such thing, because it's one every two years. The other is to show that there is another Athenian who has not done it this year, didn't do it last year, and is richer than you are. And the question is, how in a society without accountants and income tax and banks and all the rest of it, how do I prove you are richer than I am? And it's an economist's answer, not an accountant's answer. Well, anybody who hasn't read the answer on anything I, re I wrote like to guess how I prove you are richer than I am. You, you know the answer. No, you're guessing it right. You've got it. I offer to trade everything I own for everything you own. And if you turn me down, you have admitted you are richer than I am. And now you get to be the sponsor for our team at the Olympics. There are problems, but it's just a beautiful, a beautiful system, a beautifully elegant system. Uh, let me give another part of their system, which is more puzzling and, and less beautiful, but also interesting. And that is under both Athenian law and Roman law, slave testimony could only be taken under torture. And I guess what's going on is they're assuming that you mostly want slaves to give witness against their owners. The owner is going to have lots of ways of punishing the slave for betraying him. And therefore, the theory is you need the counter pressure of torture. And the obvious argument against it is that if you're tortured, you'll say whatever they want in order to get them to stop torturing. And my guess is that their theory was the interrogator could tell whether you were making it up or not. That's just a guess. But the one neat bit about it in the Athenian case is that we have two different orations discussing how reliable slave testimony near to torture is. And one of the orations says, obviously it can't be trusted because the slave will tell you whatever you, whatever you want him. And the other says it is so reliable that there has never been a case where slave testimony under torture turned out to be false. The two orations were written by the same orator. <laughs> He's selling his services for two different cases. Let me go on briefly, though, to talk about testimony under torture. Because the Visigoths had also thought about this problem. The earliest of the surviving Germanic law codes is the Visigothic Code, partly based on Roman law, it turns out. And under Visigothic law, you could also torture people. But they had figured out a solution to the problem. And their solution goes as follows. Uh, I accuse you of, of, of a capital crime, of murder. And the court decides they don't have enough evidence to either convict or acquit. So they're going to torture you to see if you'll confess. But before they can torture you, I have to give the court a detailed description of the murder that I claim happened. If your confession doesn't fit that description, it's not accepted, and I think I'm even punished for false testimony. So the idea, and if I have published the facts of the crime in advance, they can't torture you. 
So the idea is that the way of making sure your confession is real, and it's something we use in the modern legal system too, and it probably has some problems there as here, but if you confess to something you wouldn't have known unless you were the criminal, that's evidence the confession is real. So I thought that was really quite another example. These aren't stupid people. They've got problems and they've got uh, plausible solutions. Let me go on to talk about the legal system that I've actually been studying most recently, which is another one of the most interesting ones, and that's Islamic law, traditional, medieval Islamic law. Uh, the reason, one reason that should be interesting to libertarians is that just as American law claims to include in it the separation of state and church, Islamic law includes the separation of state and law that in theory and at least arguably in practice, Islamic law is not made by the ruler. It is enforced by the ruler and by God, some of it, but, but, but it's, not enforced, it's not made by the ruler. And the basic logic of traditional Islamic law as they saw it is that you start out with religious sources of information on what God wants you to do. One of them is the Quran, and the other big one is traditions of what Muhammad did and said because Muhammad was supposed to be basically divinely inspired. And you then have schools of legal scholars who take these sources of information and try to deduce legal rules from them. The Quran doesn't have very much law in it. And in the case of the Hadith, these were oral traditions for a number of generations before they were written down, so it's not trivial deciding which ones to believe, whether or not Muhammad really did and said this or just somebody said he did. So they develop an elaborate scholarship, uh, both of how you verify traditions, of what kind of evidence does or doesn't count for deciding Muhammad really did this or said this, and given what we have about what Muhammad said and what's in the Quran, how do we figure out the answers to real legal cases? And what if the Quran contradicts itself, as it sometimes did? There are three different verses in the Quran on, on wine. The first one is positive, the second one is negative, and the third one forbids it and they have ways of deciding which one dominates. And similarly with a contradiction between traditions of the Prophet and the Quran. It ended up with four different schools of Sunni law, uh, each of them basically a sequence of scholars building on their work, disagreeing in detail on the interpretation, agreeing on some things, and all agreeing that some other things were uncertain that, for example, we think this tradition is genuine, but we're not sure, and it implies the following rule, we might be wrong. Uh, and so you end up with four mutually orthodox schools, mutually orthodox meaning that none of them claims the others is heretical, and any believing Sunni Muslim will normally pick one of the four schools, and to some extent it was geographical, certain schools were dominant in certain areas, but in a big city you'd have a mix. Uh, and would try to follow the rulings, the rulings of that school. Uh, I like to say that the, is the Islamic legal system is what uh, English common law would be if you replaced judges with law professors. That is to say, the legal rules are coming out of academics trying to figure out what the law is rather than out of decisions of judges. There's no precedent. The, the Qadi, the judge, doesn't get to set the law in the future. And as the system actually seems to have worked, at least pre-Ottoman, I'll get to that in a minute, is you really have sort of four layers. The first layer is the legal, is the text themselves, the Quran and the traditions. The second layer are the legal schools, which are multiple generations of scholars, and those scholars, at least in theory, are looking back at the sources and deducing stuff from them. But eventually, by somewhere between the 10th and maybe the 13th century, the bulk of that has been done. And therefore, although there may still be new issues to be interpreted, mostly what the legal schools have done is to write books saying these are the conclusions we have reached about the legal rules. Sometimes within a single school, more than one conclusion. It may be scholar so-and-so says this, so-and-so says that. We think this is the stronger argument, but maybe the other one is right and then sometimes disagreements between the schools. All right? Then the next layer is what's called the mufti. And the mufti is a legal authority who answers questions from ordinary people. Uh, the mufti is not a government official. 
Uh, he is basically, it's a, he, he is not licensed by anybody. It's a reputational position as far as we can tell. So one of the relevant things that I've left out is that calling it law is really misleading because this is the system which really combines what we would think of as law and morality. And so some of the rules say you have to do such and such. What that means is not you'll, go to, you'll be punished by the ruler if you don't. What that means is if you do it, God will reward you. And if you don't, God will punish you in the afterlife. Uh, some things you, you will also get punished by the, by the ruler, but not all of them. So you might say, can I marry so-and-so? All right, there are some people you're not allowed to marry because they're related to you too closely. And so you go to the mufti and you say, give me a fatwa. Give me a written legal opinion as to whether under the following circumstances two people can marry. And you then follow that either way. You might also go to the mufti because you're going to have a lawsuit. So that you're going to sue somebody or you've got a partner with whom you're having a controversy or there's an inheritance that's disputed. And you go to the mufti and say, give me a fatwa describing what the law is relevant to this case. The mufti is not judging the case because he doesn't know the facts. He has no responsibility for the facts, just like an appeals court in our system as it happens, only he's happening first instead of later. What the mufti is doing is giving an expert opinion on what the law is, the law in a particular school, the school that he's following. Uh, you could then take that fatwa to the qadi, the judge, who's the fourth level, and he's the one who actually tries the case and decides the verdict and in some cases enforces the verdict. And normally the Qadi will accept the Mufti's legal summary as authoritative for what the law is, but then he has to decide how it applies to the facts. The Qadi ideally should also be a legal expert, but he doesn't literally have to be, because in principle, the Qadi faced with a difficult case can himself go to the Mufti and say, what is the law with regard to this case? Of all the people I've described, only the Qadi is a state official. So the last level of the sequence where the case is tried, you have somebody appointed by the ruler with a salary from the ruler. But all the rest of it is essentially a private system. And you then have a system of legal education, the madrasas, where the madrasas are in a sense funded by the ruler, but it may be a ruler who's been dead for 200 years because they're essentially foundations. So that you have what's called a waqf, which is someone at some point donates money or property which he will no longer control for some charitable purpose. For other purposes too, it can also be used to take care of your descendants, but, but one way is to run this mosque or to run this school. And if thereafter it's an independent, essentially self-governing thing like a, a modern foundation, uh, and that's where the, the law is being taught. So this is, it's, it's not a libertarian system in any very strong sense. The law, some of it we would agree with, some of it we would disagree with it. But it is, by, relative to what we're used to, a relatively decentralized and stateless system. And it occurred to me, thinking about it, that it actually provides a little bit of evidence on Murray Rothbard's side of my disagreement with him. Because Rothbard's view of how an anarcho-capitalist legal system works is the legal scholars figure out what the law ought to be on philosophical grounds, everybody follows it. Whereas my view is you have a competitive market generating law, as I described yesterday. Well, the Islamic system is a little bit like his system. They're not doing it out of libertarian philosophy. They're doing it out of Muslim religion. But they are a system in which you're getting a legal system developed in effect by scholars figuring out what the law ought to be rather than by a legislature or a competitive market. Now, it also has some competitive elements. In particular, it's clear that there were some times and sometimes in places where you would choose which court to go to for setting up a contract according to which school of law held that kind of contract to be legal. So there's some stuff going. All right, I'm running short of time, so let me just say that it is argued that what destroyed this system was the rise of the nation state. That essentially in the 19th and 20th century, both in areas that were colonized, such as India, and in the Ottoman Empire, which was not colonized, the state gradually took over the legal system, turned it into a system of statutory law based in theory on Islamic law, but no longer with the apparatus I've described. 
In the Ottoman Empire, going back to something like the 16th century, there is a grand mufti who is a government appointee, and he ends up controlling the universities, in effect. So the argument is that the rise of the state ultimately destroyed this system, and that that's part of the reason why Islamic law works poorly at, at present. Uh, the people who make this argument tend to be culturally pro-Islamic, even the ones who aren't Muslims, and they want to blame it all on Western colonialism. But I think they're probably wrong. The Ottoman Empire was never colonized. They want to claim the Ottoman Empire was pushed into it by Western pressure. But until the 19th century, the West isn't putting pressure on the Ottoman Empire. It's the other way around in the 16th century. And I think if you look at it, the shift towards moving the legal system into state control is happening quite early in the Ottoman Empire. And I think it really, in some ways, parallels what's happening in the West with the rise of the nation state as you shift from feudalism to absolute monarchy in places like England, uh, France, and so forth. So the whole question of what happened is interesting. The people who write about this, I think, have a tendency to see the system through rose-colored glasses. They are probably too optimistic about how it worked when it was working, but it did work. It was a functional society and an interesting one. Lots more stuff I could talk about, but I gather I'm out of time. So go to my web page and read it there. Thank you, David Friedman.